to Acts chapter 20. And I'm going to ask again if we have somebody with a loud voice who's willing to read and me to interrupt them. Is that working? There we go. Hello. There we go. Do I have a loud volunteer? If not, I'll pick one out. Yep. All right. So, uh, let me remind you where we're at. That is really annoying. Uh, Brandon, yes. Uh, what part of Acts here? Uh, chapter 20. Okay. I'm just going to speak really loud. Because this is just making more noise than anything. As soon as I touch that, then other noises start. I don't know what the deal is here. Other than our enemy, he loves to do this. Where's that sword? I think they needed to open the candy. Okay. <laughs> Because they're trying really hard. <laughs> okay, to tell you where we're at is in the book of Acts, we had, in 19, you had Paul going through the city, and he had every day this, um, was this this section? Uh, anyway, um, he, uh, it was in Ephesus, and... He was telling them about their uh, idol worship and had these, this guy named Demetrius. Um, he starts trying to get a mob together and they're shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And they about had a riot. And uh, Paul was taken away. And uh, in chapter 20, verse 1, he's moved on. But he's going to call some of the people from Ephesus to come and meet him, and he can talk with them, but not in Ephesus where he's going to get killed. So uh, we'll start there. Verse when the war had ended, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. He traveled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece. Where he stayed three months. Okay, so you notice he, the same word is used tw twice. He gathered the disciples together and encouraged them. And then before he left, he, had, he used words of encouragement to the people. And that's one thing I'm noticing in our world. There's not a whole lot of encouragement. Um, there's a lot of people, as soon as they don't like something, they'll tell you all about it. They'll backbite. They will cause problems. They'll start riots. Um, but what God wants is more people encouraging. Um, I've been doing this daily devotional for a month and a half or so now, and that's the next one that's coming out. That's what I'm talking about, is God didn't send me to be a heresy hunter, finding out where everybody's wrong. He didn't call me... Um, to pick arguments with everyone. He tells us that people who are argumentative uh, cause division in the church. That's not why he sent me. He sent, didn't send me to argue about words. Um, but what he did send me to do is tell people about Jesus, the gospel, the good news, that though they have sinned and fallen short, God has provided a way of forgiveness and encouraging them in that. And even though we've fallen, we've messed up, he's willing to still take us. He's, he's not the God of second chances. He's the God of a hundred. He's the, the thousandth chance where you've fallen down and you've messed up 
And if you're willing to come back and ask forgiveness, he says he's going to do it 700 times a day. Or is it 490? It was 7 times 7. Uh, 70 times 7. So 490 times a day, he's willing to forgive you. As long as you're still asking for it. So, what maybe you need to look in each of our individual lives. Where have you encouraged someone today? Where have you just been kind? When, when they're giving you evil, you're meeting them with kindness. Uh, Julia's telling that story about the, this army coming back to life. That army is God's church. And we don't fight with the weapons that they used at that time. We have one weapon. And that weapon is love. And if we love people, we will share that love with them. We will pray for them. We will talk to them during difficult times. We will be there for people. And that's, that's the warfare we have. Most of it is within ourselves. Because we're always too worried about how we feel and what is going on in our heart instead of somebody else who really needs it, who, who may be at the end of the rope. And uh, so that's what Paul does is he's just been chased out of town, thrown in jail, he's been beat. And what's he do? He gripes and complains until he's blue in the face? No. He encourages these people. He comes to their town to offer forgiveness and love. He's chased out, but the ones who are willing, he's still offering words of encouragement. So, go ahead. Verse 3. Because some Jews had plotted against him, just as he was about to sell to Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Thyrus from Berea. This, this, she's very brave, or she didn't know all these names were going to be in here. Because there's lots of names in this section, so I'm sorry. <laughs> So Paul was not alone, even though he may have felt alone some of the times. He had all these people with him. Go ahead. These men went on ahead and sailed and waited for us at Troas. But we sailed from Philippi after the festival of unleavened bread, and five days later joined the others at Troas, where they stayed seven days. Here's, here's one of those stories that my kids probably heard a hundred times too, along with the dead, dry bones. There's just certain stories that, that when you hear it, you go, wow. And this is one of those stories, so pay close attention. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. So be real careful if you fall asleep in church. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the first glory <laughs> and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. <clears throat> Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. That's just one of those stories. It, to me, it's just so awesome. One, you have God's man, and he's preaching, and he's preaching, and he's preaching. And he, he's full of energy, full of vim and vinegar, so much so that people are getting so tired that they're falling out the window and die. And so showing that it's not just words, but there's power, he goes out to that man, that young man, and lays across him 
and he comes back to life. And you go, well, that's crazy. That's unheard of. No, it's not. He was a good Jewish boy. He heard all the stories. He heard the stories of um, Elijah and Elisha. So Elijah had come to this town, and um, this lady had taken care of him, and her son dies. And he lays across that child, eye to eye, nose to nose, laying right over the top of him, and prays. And the kid comes back to life. So that was Elijah. Elisha had the same thing happen. A child, young person died, and he did the same thing. He had seen the guy that he helped, Elijah. He knew he had seen, the, he had seen this happen before. And he did the same thing. He laid across him, and he prayed. It didn't happen instantly, but he prayed several times, and then he came back to life. This happened so much, um, the song about the dry bones that we've sung here in the past, there's a section of it that says, ask the man that, uh, that fell on Elijah's bones whether God's powerful or not. Because he fell, they, they, there was a dead man, they dug the hole right next to Elijah or Elisha, and they threw his bones in, threw his dead body on top of the bones, and the kid came back to life. This is not new. This is the power of God. Julia can shout as much as she wants into the little jar with bones. But unless God says for that thing to come back to life, she's wasting her time. But if God is with them, anything is possible. Anything is possible. So, <laughs> the other part that makes me laugh is, well, then they go upstairs after he's brought back to life. They break bread and they eat. And then what's Paul continued to do? He keeps preaching until daylight. Okay, how many people are staying here until tomorrow morning listening to me preach? Probably not going to happen. But these people were so excited, so given over to God, that whatever was asked of them, whatever opportunity they had, they gave it. So, verse 13. <coughs> So he's encouraging these, the elders of the church, the ones who run the church in Ephesus. Okay, it's not dead. Here's some things. You watch me. Now you do the same thing with these people. You know that I was not fearful. Um, I, I did not hesitate to preach anything that would be helpful to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. So there are times things are taught and people don't want to hear them, one. And it's, um, 
other people don't want you to teach them. But he was willing to teach, no matter what it was, God was calling him to teach. And he did it publicly where everyone could hear, and he did it from house to house. He, he'd go over to someone's house, and he would teach whoever would show up. And so through my ministry, it's been that too. There's Sometimes it's from house to house. Sometimes the church is in the house. Sometimes I'm speaking in front of a couple of hundred people. Uh, sometimes I'm speaking to 50 people. Sometimes I'm speaking to two. And you have to be willing, is what he's telling these elders, you have to be willing to speak whatever God needs spoken. Uh, so they must, or he's saying, I, verse 21, I declare to both Jews and to Greeks that they must return to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. So that's people, one of the things in our culture and, and lots of cultures, people want to know what can I do? What can I do to make God happy with me? Well, if I, if I, if I give out food, well, is then God going to be happy with me? If I give out clothes, is, is then God going to be happy with me? If I um, do this other thing, is God going to be happy with me? That's not the things that makes your relationship with God. That's just overflow of a changed heart. What you have to do is repent. Change, you have your, be willing to have your life changed. And then trust in Jesus. That he lived for you. He died for you. He rose from the dead for you. And he paid the debt. He paid the price for everything that we've ever done. So in that repentance, it's, it's turning away from the evil things. There's things that we, we know in our lives are evil. And then there's other things we come across and we go, yep, I probably shouldn't be involved in that. And, and that's slowly changing your mind. And uh, so we're to repent and have faith in Jesus. So verse 22.
Then they accompanied him to the ship. So there's all kinds of things to, after verse 22 to the end that we could focus on. But you've got to remember, this is, this is Paul speaking to the leaders of the church of Ephesus. So he's trying to encourage them. And this is going to be the last time they're ever going to see him face to face. He's not going to see them again. He's not going to be, he, he'll be able to send them a letter, and we can read that letter, but he's not going to be able to speak to them face to face again. So he just mentions all kinds of things. One is the reason he's not going to see him again is because he's going to be taken to prison. He's going to spend time in prison. He's going to be separated from everyone. And all he's going to be able to do is send letters. So he also says, I am innocent of the blood of all men. And I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's in Ezekiel. And uh, Ezekiel gets called from God and, uh, and God tells him to go and speak to these people. And he says, but all these people are, are hard-headed, hard-hearted. They're not going to want to listen to me. And, and God's pretty much telling him, it doesn't matter. What matters is, is you're obedient to me and you go and say what I'm telling you to say. And he explains to him, this is in Ezekiel chapter 2, 3, and 4. I'm just giving you the short version. Um, he says, your, their blood is on your hands if you don't speak to them. Their blood is on your hands. In other words, their souls will be lost unless you speak to them. And if you don't speak to them... It's your fault. And then he explains to him, you know what, they're not going to listen to you anyway, but you still need to tell them. And then he says, explains to him that this is in all situations. Um, if you tell a good man who's in sin to turn and he turns, then you're free of his blood. But if you refuse, his blood's on your hand. If you tell an evil person to turn and they refuse to turn, their blood is not on your hands. And that's something we have to think about in this world where we go around in a world that it doesn't take too many times to watch the news to see that our world is lost and they need our message. This is kind of a side note, but if any of you know who Joe Rogan is, when Joe Rogan says on his podcast, the world needs Jesus to come back, that's scary. He spent most of his life as an atheist saying bad things, and now he's saying the world needs Jesus. And that happened with another great atheist. I can't remember his name. I just saw it this week. He was talking, he's talked his entire life about dismantling Christianity, get rid of the Bible, all this stuff is garbage. And now he's English and he sees uh, a different religion taking over his country and he's going, Christianity needs to be the core of our culture. Because <laughs> he sees if you don't believe with them, they'll just chop your head off. And he goes, ah, maybe Christianity is a loving religion. So, Paul's telling his people the same thing. You have an obligation. You have an obligation to share this truth with everyone. So, And in verse 35, it is more blessed to receive. Excuse me, sir. Let me find you Jesus. There's Jesus. <laughs> you can't take him home, but you can't have him while you're here. You can take the real Jesus home. 
So um, in verse 35, he says, it's more blessed to give than receive. It's one of those things that is imprinted in your head that, oh, it's great when somebody gives me this thing or gives that thing or gives this, and we're always wanting something. But when you find out when you give and you give something to someone that it fills your heart more than that thing ever could. Um, I think my daughter Abby was learning this this last week when she was cleaning out her room and seeing all the things she just had to have over the last several years. And now she's throwing them in the trash. But the, for a moment, that thing was great. It was the whole world. But now it's just garbage. And that's where our selfish self-centeredness gets us. And, uh, um, but when we give... It feeds our heart. It feeds our soul more than anything else. Uh, how many times does Julie come? Oh, we got several bags out today because she's feeling that joy. She doesn't have monetary things to give. She doesn't have a million dollars to hand out to people. But she has some clothes that other we freely given or we we freely. Re- Freely received. So now we're freely giving. And it gives you a joy in your heart. When we're doing the the food, it's joyous. You have people who, it was a couple of guys here yesterday. I know had had been in prison and had not been out very long. And people had stolen some of his stuff. He didn't have a whole lot, but people were stealing what he had. And two or three times while he was here, thank you, Randy. You don't know how much I appreciate this. Thanks so much for what you're doing. That fills your heart more than some little trinket, some little thing. So as as we repent, as we change our mind, we change how our mind works, that's one of the things we have to change. We have to practice that and see how different we feel when we give than it is to receive. So then he's, he's kneeling down and praying and he's weeping and they're weeping and, because they know this section of their life is over. And uh, this part of Paul's ministry is over. He's heading to Jerusalem and he's going to be punished. So... Uh, chapter 21 next week if you want to read ahead see what's going to go on Uh, but I'll do Micaiah's favorite part Uh, any thoughts questions stones in your pocket yeah